presenting the Sex Ed Champion Award to Justine Font. Nobody wants to wake up and see their name in the headlines in that kind of negative light. And the easy thing to do would be to retreat. And that's not what Justine did. And uh, knowing Justine as a person, that's not who Justine is as a person. Justine is an extraordinary human being with so much passion and so much experience to share with the field of sex education. And I just want to acknowledge her and all the other people across the country. I see you, Lisa Schulz, in the chat and so many others who are fighting these good fights in their home fronts. And I just want to shout out all of you to say, we see you. We are here to support you and thank you. And so at this time, I'm going to ask Justine, we sent her a little box before uh, the uh, award ceremony today that we'd love for you to open up your award and your, your box with us now. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, all Dan. right. So there's this box that came in. I have not seen it yet. I'm going to open up this first part. Justine, we're so grateful to call you a friend of Amaze and for all that you offer students in sex education and the sex education space. Thank you. All right. So here it is. <laughs> oh my God. Lincoln. <laughs> oh <Yeah>. my God. <laughs> this is so beautiful. <laughs> I was asking Lincoln like three days ago, can I have an avatar for my slides? Everyone else has an avatar. And he said, we'll see, we'll see. And he snuck it in. Oh my gosh, here it is, everyone. This is so, so beautiful. Thank you. Oh, there it is. I'm a cartoon. I've made it. Justine, Thank there's you. no higher honor at Amaze than to have an avatar made of you. It is, you have reached the top. And this avatar is especially holding our award, the Janie, for you as our sex ed champion. So thank you for all you do. Thank you for keynoting with us today and welcome. Thank you so much, Dan. Thank you, thank you. Oh my gosh, this is awesome. This is so awesome. We love you, Justine. <sighs> I love Amaze. I loved Amaze before I was smeared. Um, all right, let me do like a mini like thank you before I get into um, full on keynote mode. Um, <laughs> um, this summer was really hard, y'all. It was really, really hard. Um, and for those of you that followed what happened, I'm sure you can empathize with what an experience like that must have been. And I really mean it that it was specifically my family and my inner circle of best friends and amaze.org and everyone behind that gave me the specific support that I needed. And I'll go into like what healing looked like for me, but um, I felt so fortified to have picked a career in specifically sexuality education because it has always been such a uh, source of comfort, of encouragement, um, but especially when I'm in a crisis, they came through for me. Um, Amaze came through for me. Um, the SLAM family came through for me. It was always a sex educator that knew how to give me the care that I needed. And um, that's not something I could say about people that I thought were friends of mine. And so I have new, very close friends as a result of what has happened. And um, I've been affirmed in the people that I've decided to, you know, have a part of my career, you know, be continuing to be in my career um, because of what happened. Um, and when I was informed that I was uh, being invited to be the keynote for my most favorite sex ed organization, there really is no higher honor. And um, the icing on that cake just got even sweeter with my very own <laughs> cartoon avatar. So thank you so much, Amaze. This is truly an honor. And um, I am so excited for what we're going to be doing together for our youth, for the parents of the, that youth, and really for this world, because you really are game changers and making lives so much better. Um, and I am just privileged to be a part of that movement. So thank you, thank you, 
Thank you. Welcome to the Amaze Sex Ed Conference. I am zooming in to you from Lenape territory in New York City, and I am really privileged to be sharing with you what I know of intersectionality and how it has really transformed how I teach. So I'm going to talk to you about how we need to move sex education forward in a way that doesn't stop at comprehensive. I know we still have states that are doing nothing at all. We have states that are doing abstinence only. We have states that are doing abstinence plus, and then we have states that are doing comprehensive sex education. I want states to be doing intersectional sex education. And I know it is possible and I know the effects of that. I'm excited to share with you what that means, what the impacts are, and that it is possible. And I have been privileged to be in schools that allow me to do this very thing. But it's not just about learning what Professor Kimberly Crenshaw has taught us about intersectionality. It's about being about it. It's about living it. It's about really making sure that your lens as you traverse life is about making things be seen through an intersectional lens, having experiences that are accessible to everyone. As I'd mentioned in that montage, health is a human right. Not everyone has equal access to it. That is because we are still living in a white supremacist world. We are still living in a world that does not want someone like me, someone um, like me to be able to even talk about these things, but experience sexual liberation. So if I'm an adult in a classroom with young people who look like me, who are a person of color, what does it mean for them? But we have that ability. We have not just the knowledge and the education, but we're teachers. And we have the gift and the skill set, the artistry to be able to bring that knowledge to them in a way that they can understand, but in a way that they can slowly push the envelope a little bit further and further. So if I'm going to be about intersectionality, I first have to tell you who I am from. I am from the ancestors in my life who are both living and past from the motherland of the Philippines. These two pictures on the left here are of my parents when they were young, young people. And they are also on this Zoom somewhere on there. So give some shout outs to uh, my parents who are on this Zoom. These are my um, ancestors who have passed. Most recently, my maternal grandmother who passed this past spring, right before my life also turned double upside down. So these are my grandparents, and it's important for me that you see what they look like and who they are, because they have greatly informed who I am and how I come into a space, how I come into a classroom, and how I talk to my young people, because I know that they are not just a student that is studying for their test the next day or trying to be a good child to their parents or a good friend. They also have a story that they've already come into that classroom space with. And I wanna know pieces of that because so much of intersectionality is about storytelling and sharing who you are in the fullest, most authentic ways. Here is me in California, 1985. This is on day one. I was born and raised in Ohlone territory and um, to parents that immigrated to California in the 1970s. This is my older brother, Vince, and uh, he is now a commander in the Navy. So this is my day one here, right? And when we're thinking about womb to the tomb, did I get that opportunity to have intersectional sex education parented to me or a lived experience from day one? No, the answer is not. The answer is not the case that I had womb to the tomb experience. But I started to really have some self-awareness because I didn't look like everyone else in the schools that I went to. And already this is the Silicon Valley, which many of us know is quite diverse. Now, in diverse in terms of race, but back in the eight, 1989, not so much. And then I went to a elementary school that was equally not diverse, a high school that was even less diverse. And then I went to UC San Diego, which was quite diverse. But that's when I started to question, who am I and who am I in this world? And what is my role in this world? 
And being raised as a Catholic and not just a Filipina, but a Filipina Catholic told me a lot about who I am and how I'm supposed to serve others, my role as a Catholic. And also what does that mean about how I under understand sexuality? Today, as a sex educator, I think about being raised Catholic so much, so much, because I know that for many people that were raised like me, it holds them back. And I also know that there are community spaces that are actually moving this forward in a way that faith and sexuality can live together, not just in unison, but also in liberation. We're far from achieving that fully, but having this background and having this um, childhood that was heavily, heavily a part of the Catholic church and Sunday mass every single week was something that um, I really, really think about in how I'm reaching my students who are faith-based, whose par parents are very maybe draconian in their thinking and how I can still reach across and allow them to feel authentic in themselves and be seen as their full self. Now, when I was growing up, I figured there were only really three things that I could be. I could be a news anchor, a figure skater or a physician all totally fine and well, great professions. But it was specifically that in the 1990s, these were the only women that looked like me that I saw on a regular basis. So Connie Chung on the left, news anchor, Christy Yamaguchi in the middle, Olympic figure skater. And maybe you don't know, but you should know my mother, a physician, rheumatologist and internal medicine specialist. And so when we're thinking about visuals and representation, I felt limited on who I could be because this is all that seemed closest to me. And if I were going to be really seen, it meant that I would have to be limited to professions that white folks were already comfortable seeing on a regular basis. Now, as I started to explore more about my racial identity, it was interesting being a brown Asian in a culture that is quite anti-Black. The darker my skin was, the less value I was deemed to have. But that wasn't something that made sense to me until I was an adult. As a competitive tennis player and captain the women's tennis team at UC San Diego, I was in the sun all the time. Sometimes people would ask me if I was multiracial Black because I would get so tan. And it was just a really interesting experience because my family didn't always receive my tanness in the same way that my white friends did, who thought it was something sought after. You're, I, I'm so jealous of you. You have such beautiful skin and it's just so golden. But in the Philippines, it would be the complete opposite. It'd be like, aren't you American? Why are you so dark? And I didn't make sense of the anti-Blackness again until later on. I thought it was a skin cancer type of protection that they kept bringing up to me. But it was something that was always on my mind because tennis was a huge part of my life, four hours a day, every day, up until I was 22 years old. Ask me now, I barely play. Burnout is a real thing. Nonetheless, this was a huge part of my life. So in 2008, I decided I'm gonna become a teacher. And before I started in my placement school in the state of Hawaii, I started in the abstinence only state of Texas. I had a classroom of 24 students who uh, were in Houston, Texas at this Title I middle school. And of the 24 students, two were already pregnant in this eighth grade class and two were already parents in this eighth grade class. But there was also one other student there that really made an imprint on my journey towards being a sex educator. Her name was Maria. And Maria did not show up for two out of the five weeks that I was teaching this summer school. When she returned to the classroom, I asked her, are you okay? Where have you been? I've been trying to call um, home to find out. She had told me that she had been sick and that she had been bleeding a lot. I was very concerned. I asked her, you know, what do you mean bleeding? Where? And she said, miss, down there. And I was just thinking down there could mean anything. I thought it was like some type of external trauma she was experiencing only to find out with it when she said down there, after probing more, she had meant 
she was actually having her period but she had no idea what to call it. She had no language for it. She didn't understand why it was happening. She just knew it hurt so much to the point where she couldn't walk, she couldn't come to school. Her parents didn't know about this. They were working more than one job and she felt bad. She didn't want to put them in a position to have to take off work to then get her the care she needs. So she just didn't come to school. Maria was 16 years old in eighth grade. So if you're a teacher in the United States, you know that when you're in eighth grade, you're typically 13 to 14 years old. This was her repeating eighth grade for the third time. She has missed half of the school year since sixth grade because that is when her period started. I went to the principal later on that um, lunchtime and told her you have a 16 year old student who comes to school half of the year because she's on her period. What are you not teaching and why not? And she said, Justine, it's a slippery slope here. It's abstinence only in Texas. And I said, does that also mean that you're abstaining from teaching science? Because you have students who are not able to academically achieve or even show up to school because they don't know how to make sense of what's happening to their body. So those last two days uh, that I was in the summer school, I told the principal that I would be teaching sex ed. I was a peer health educator back in high school. So I mustered up my old curriculum from back in the day and tried to make sense of it in the 2008 version of it. I was warned, however, by the principal that there were three things I could not say in those two days, despite her approving that I would teach sex ed. I couldn't say the word abortion, contraception, or homosexuality. It's like it was at the back pocket. They knew exactly what I could not do. So the smart aleck in me said, that's fine. I have a thesaurus will be great. So I taught these two classes. And when I was placed then in the state of Hawaii, I started to incorporate social justice education into my math classroom. If we're talking about bar graphs and ratios and proportions, we can certainly use the statistics and the world around us to actually learn more about it through math. And that's what I did in a social change project that they did throughout the entire school year. I wanted to make sure that what they were learning wasn't just the numbers and how to make sense of it and calculate it, but also how to make sense of the world around them. So I had students that were doing research around abortion rights. They were doing work around incarceration rates, about diabetes. They were doing things about environmental aspects due to the amount of um, pain that the physical island of Oahu had experienced. And so we were doing a lot of work um, around how colonization has impacted the, um, the island. We did a lot of work around how our bodies were being oppressed on the regular while they were still learning math. That was my first real work doing intersectional education without even knowing that there was a term for it. As I was doing that, I was studying really hard and I obtained two degrees over those next four years. It was important for me to not only get that master's in education so that I knew how to teach and command a classroom and create lesson plans and develop curricula, but also apply specifically sex education in a way that was accessible. So I island hopped from Oahu to Manhattan and I got the master's degree in public health from Columbia University completing in 2012. So moving along on this timeline, I started my job at the Dalton School in Manhattan. Here, I was afforded a unique opportunity to not just be the founder of a health and wellness program, but also lead this department and the school in doing work that is socially just across the subjects. Now, as a result of what I started to build here, the relationships that I made with parents and with the faculty, I knew that students were not effectively going to absorb and retain health education content without the two other branches of a school also being equipped with similar education. So I made sure that there were parent workshops throughout the year. There were faculty professional development workshops throughout the year, that they were informed about statistics as to what's happening with our students in anonymous fashion, but also recognizing that they may not become close to me as their health teacher. They may be close to their English teacher. They may be close to their parent and their parent and their English teacher 
also need to be informed around what different aspects of mental health literacy, substance misuse, um, education looks like, food relationships, and sexuality means. So I made sure for these lessons to live outside of a 45 minute block that I had teaching health class, but also in dinner conversations, walks home from school, drives home to drives, drives to school, and also in the time that they're having with advisory and their teachers. I was so proud of the program that I had built at the Dalton School. And in those nine years there, I had gotten a lot of um, recognition around the country to the point where other schools were seeking out what I had done at Dalton to bring to their own communities. I was doing assemblies with students in big groups, in small groups. I was doing um, assemblies and workshops with parents across the country. I was doing panels of all different aspects of health education for parents to access um, beyond just the small workshops in the school communities. And in the classroom settings, I would continue to provide that health education and sex education in the ways that students are used to in smaller classroom formats. I was invited um, several times by a New York City comedy club to be the sex expert for this dating show, this 90s dating game show. And so helping adults navigate relationships and dating that they're dealing with. And in that time as well, I co-created Raise Pinai, which is a production inspired by the vagina monologues that I had been a part of for many years. And I wanted to make sure that Filipina stories were represented on a stage. So we brought together a group of women in, 2000, in 2016 and went through months of drama therapy of unearthing their most vulnerable stories of their womanhood, where we shared on stage and as a fundraiser for Roots of Health, which is the NGO that I am vice president of the board for based in Palawan, Philippines. Think of it like a Planned Parenthood in the Philippines. And when you're thinking about the Philippines and the draconian Catholic, Catholic uh, country that it is, it is extremely radical to have something like Roots of Health present delivering sex education for its young people in schools and delivering it for families so that they can actually learn, but also have access to prenatal, postnatal care and access to protective methods should they not want to have a child at this time or anymore. All of these services free of charge and completely legal, but just so uncommon in a country like the Philippines. So being a part of this community, Raise Penai, was the first of four generations where we've now raised $45,000, raising money for Roots of Health in the Philippines, but also uplifting Filipina American stories in New York City um, for the last six years. And then on May 20th, 2021, my world went upside down. And the thing that was ironic is that this was um, meant to be a month to celebrate someone like me. Asian American Pacific Islander month. Instead of that celebration on May 20th, I got a phone call um, that I thought was actually a person that I had given my phone number to, to schedule a first date from a dating app I had met this person on. I answered the call and I said, hello, thinking it was that person because they said they were being calling that night. And instead it was the New York Post asking for a quotation from me to defend myself for a recent lesson I had delivered over the course of my 10 years, but delivered recently that month. That article became two the following weekend, it became three the following weekend, and it became four the end of that month. So June was a tough time for me. While I'm still teaching my first, second, and third graders health class, and having this level of vitriol come into my inbox in a global scale was something I had never experienced and wouldn't wish even on my enemies. What was interesting about this experience was that I was born and raised to be a people pleaser and the complete opposite was happening. And what the New York Post actually challenged in me was thinking about whether or not I was actually wrong. I really questioned if whether or not what I was doing was the right work. Because I was so used to making everyone happy around me, being a caregiver, and people were angry at me, to say the least. 
not just angry, but people wanted me dead. And this was such an incredibly powerful experience because I had to evaluate how important it was for me to people please or who are important to me. Now, people were furious, parents alike, schools alike, right-wing conservative media alike, to the point where the amount of attention this was getting was really uncommon for sex education. We've always gotten heat, but never to this global scale. And mentors of mine that I had reached out to close to the Amaze community and in the sex ed world had gone through similar experiences, not to the degree that I was experiencing, but they had all advised me, lay low, there's gonna be a new news cycle in three weeks. But this was different because I had four articles from this tabloid that was written about me. And after those four articles were written, it just felt like it was never gonna end. The news cycle just recycled into being something about what I was doing, leading all the way up to my resignation from the school. And so I had learned that when it comes to vitriol that's being sent back to you, you can decide to stay quiet about it. And that may be wise if you feel that that is the safest option for you. And it honestly probably would have been, but I am still here today. And I do know that it's not in me to just be quiet. I'm too much of an extrovert, too much of a Capricorn to let that happen. I wanted to turn this notoriety into something productive for our community. Because what I realized was this, sexuality educators are actually building actual change and it's our collective strength that makes other people fear us. And that was something that I recognized. What I'm doing is actually right. And I kept thinking about, you know, what my father actually said to me in this time. He had said, Tin, if you know what you're doing is right, is moral, and is ethical, then you need to stand proud and know that you're always going to have people that are in opposition to what you're doing. But that doesn't mean that you stop doing what you're doing. And that was really powerful coming from an immigrant who's in a survival mentality, yet knows that his daughter has the audacity to claim equity and freedom in her generation. And that's exactly what I wanted to do, not just for me, but make sure that I was the last person to be villainized in this way. So I left the Dalton School. Nine years as the Director of Health and Wellness. This is me leaving my office in tears, but with grace and with compassion for what this school had afforded me in those nine years to develop something that no other school was doing and to set me up and team me up to be able to have a life in freelance. So now, how do I heal? Well, I'll tell you what healing looked like for me because hopefully this can be practical for any of you if you're just going through a tough time, hopefully not something as intense as what I experienced. But healing was really important because that is a huge part of intersectionality, understanding all of your identities and leveraging the ones that can help you heal at that moment. So in the short term, my healing looked like food deliveries from friends that just really understood me. These things were just popping up in my front door and that was everything. I got a lot of text messages that were just saying, sending you love and sending you strength. Appreciated, but I replied with a heart emoji because I had no capacity to say anything more than that. But it's the food deliveries that I felt seen I felt loved and really cared for to physically nourish my body with food of my people. This Filipino food delivery was so meaningful to me. I cried before I could eat it. Flowers were sent to me, of course, from afar. Karaoke nights were an absolute necessity to let it all out. I flew to Kansas to be with my best friend so that I could move cattle and be in a place where most people don't know the New York Post or would see or recognize my face like they often did in New York City. And oh. 
rage rooms, great invention. Ah, it helped me so much. So that's all the short-term healing. What does long-term healing look like though? Because that's really what was key. I didn't want to just get over it. I wanted to make sure that I was sustainably going to be okay. And what that looked like was first understanding that this smear campaign was specifically against an Asian woman. So what does that mean? And how did we get to that point? Well, we live in a world that is still run by white supremacy. Currently in the United States, we are a nation that is very divided. There is a current racial reckoning that we are experiencing, whether it be in our schools, our companies, or even in our own families and communities. We are experiencing a global pandemic. There's technology that captures and spreads news faster than any other time period we've been in. And when you add all of that together, yeah, go ahead and smear an Asian woman during AAPI month. So I started to try to make sense of this. Now, what I learned is tip number one for long-term healing, compassion for our shared oppression. Now, take a look at what happened in my inbox. People tracked down my, e uh, my email address and I got two different types of emails that I was always scared. Was this gonna be a good one or a bad one? I would open it up and one said, Dear Justine, I read about you in the news. I'm a mother of three and as a child was molested by my uncle for 11 years. I'm encouraged to know that my children may get the education I wish I had that could have set me free. Thank you for what you are doing for our youth. Immediately after, as I'm going through my inbox, I get this email. Your mother should have aborted you and if you ever step foot in my country, I'll shoot you myself. Now let's take a pause here and look at how different these two messages are. What do these two messages from strangers have in common? I'll tell you, they're both hurting. They're both hurting. One is on the up and up on healing and the other may not even know that they need to heal. So what I learned is that when it comes from the hurt, where is that hurt coming from? It's coming from white supremacy. And what I know about the white supremacist culture that it normalizes in us is that it affected me in this experience. So of the tenants of white supremacy, here were the ones that were very clear in terms of how it was impacting my life at this moment. The either or thinking, the power hoarding, the sense of urgency, the paternalistic thinking, uh, objectivity, fear of open conflicts, the right to comfort, and individualism. Now, these are just some of Tima Okun's white supremacist uh, tenets here. I encourage you to look up the rest because it is extremely critical in how we are teaching intersectional health education and just understanding our place in the world. We have normalized so many of these things in our own world, even me as someone who is not white because I am someone in that world. And these things were very relevant to my experience. So if this is something I'm dealing with, I can see this as a comparison to what our kids are dealing with on the regular in their own classroom spaces, whether or not they're BIPOC. Individualism is one of the tragedies, many tragedies that come from our white supremacist mentalities. We don't wanna think as a collective. We don't wanna think as a community. And that is where it was so clear that most of my healing was coming from the people around me in my community. It's the sexuality liberators and movers folks, my fam from there, Stephanie Zapata, Tanya Bass, Melissa Carnegie. They're the ones that came through for me in ways that other people were not because they understood the situation that I was in, in a way that necessitated community, community healing. So number two, 
for long-term healing affirmation that my pedagogy is actually supported. Now you all know sex ed is a real and helpful thing. Here are just some statistics to fortify that. 93% of American adults support sex education. 62% of Republicans believe the government should support comprehensive sex ed programs. I should know in the citation, this is in 2009. However, there was a time in the United States where it was a majority of Republicans. And I want that to be known at a sex ed conference. More than 140 organizations support comprehensive sex education, including the American Academy of Pediatrics, American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, American Medical Association, American Public Health Association, and the National Education Association. So if you need to ever get backups as to why you're doing what you're doing, screenshot this right now. I give you my full consent. Show that to your head of school. Show it to your principal. Show it to your parent that's giving pushback because they are in the minority there if they don't like what you're doing around comprehensive sex ed. Why do so many people support this? Because look at the outcomes. We develop an appreciation for sexual diversity. We develop information and education that's so life-saving around dating and intimate partner violence. We know how to understand and make sense of a healthy relationship and how to cultivate one. Look for red flags as how to get out of one or be an ally to a friend who is in an unhealthy one. We understand how to prevent child sexual abuse. And the additional outcomes, yes, we have social emotional learning, schools want to hear those buzzwords, media literacy, box checked. So we know the outcomes of doing comprehensive sex ed, but how does that actually happen? And what exactly is it? High quality comprehensive sex education is science-based, medically accurate, and complete. It's age developmentally and culturally appropriate. It provides sexual health information to address the physical, mental, emotional, and social dimensions of human sexuality for all young people. It's CSE that has taught, that, uh, that's taught by trained educators sequentially throughout students' school years and includes information and skills development related to a range of topics, including human development, healthy relationships, personal safety, pregnancy and reproduction, HIV and other STIs, sexual behavior, including abstinence and sexual health and identity, identity. So when we talk about reaching students, we can't just reach the students in the time we have them. We have to reach out to parents. We have to reach out to faculty and staff. Any adult that is in this child's life, maybe it's a coach, maybe it's the bus drivers, maybe it's the security, maybe it's the cafeteria staff. We wanna make sure that they are also equipped. Now, it's important that when we're going into that classroom, we're already comfortable because we know that the parents were formed ahead of time. We already are comfortable because after they leave that 45 minute session with you, they then go to math class and that teacher is well informed about the work that you're covering. It's our duty to make sure that it doesn't get canceled out after they leave your time because I know how limited sex ed or health ed is in most schools that aren't prioritizing it. So are we tapping on the resources of the DEI department? the diversity equity inclusion department? Are we doing trainings for other faculty members of other subjects, figuring out how math can be integrated with sex ed? How English should be making sure that literatures are written by queer authors, that history is actually doing real history that looks like critical race theory, that we're learning real things in the classroom, that art is talking about bodies and how we're representing and expressing ourselves. Right, All of these subjects can be sex ed and within the wheelhouse that is that teacher. So I creatively did that and this is why schools seek me out to make sure it's not interdisciplinarily done, but it's intersectionally done. So comprehensive needs to start meaning intersectional. I want Merriam-Webster dictionary to replace comprehensive sex ed with intersectional sex ed because it's not enough just to teach them the bird and the bee. 
and then add on to that some vocabulary so that they know all of the different language that's out there if they don't have equal access to it. So what is intersectionality? Let's let our friends from Amaze explain that to you. And this is my Aunt Sylvia on the dance floor with her friend Gary and his husband. And this is me with some of her work friends having cake. And here's a cool group shot. Wow, a lot of different types of people came together for your aunt's wedding. Definitely. That sort of reminds me of what you were telling me about intersectionality, Mom. What's intersectionality? Intersectionality is a term developed by a professor named Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw to help people better understand their lives in society. Think of it this way. An intersection is a place where multiple things come together. An intersectionality refers to the fact that we all have multiple identities that intersect, that make us who we are, and affect the way we experience the world around us. Multiple identities? Well, take me for example. You know me as your friend's mom. I'm also African American and a woman. I might experience racism since I'm African American, and I might also experience sexism since I'm a woman. Those are two of my identities that intersect to make me experience both racism and sexism in a different way than if I was only African American or if I was only a woman. And each of these identities also influences my likelihood to be either privileged or oppressed. In other words, whether I have a special advantage or disadvantage when it comes to things like how much money I make, the job I have, my level of education, or even getting good health care. Intersectionality helps us talk about the way that privilege or oppression could be reinforced or complicated when they overlap in a particular person. Here's an example that might help. My uncle Sylvester is pretty rich and also an African-American man who happens to have diabetes. Even though he is privileged because he has a lot of money and can afford the best doctors, he's faced discrimination and racism because he's also black and has diabetes. Or think about my friend Sandra. She's a white woman, a single mother, and she just got laid off from her job at an insurance company. Since white people don't experience racism, she is privileged. But because she's a woman and a single mother, she's finding it hard to get a new job that pays enough to take care of her kids on just one salary. Men often get paid more to do the same job as a woman for no reason other than their gender. That is discrimination based on gender. Intersectionality helps us understand how overlapping identities cause people to experience more privilege or oppression in society. And if you can recognize where you have privilege, you can use it to speak out against types of discrimination that affect others in ways that are unjust. How do I do that? Because you're a heterosexual white male with privilege, it's important that you stand up for someone who is being bullied and make space for others in places or situations where you have privilege. Thanks, Mrs. G, and thanks for explaining intersectionality to me. I'm definitely going to think more about it and try to stand up for others who are being discriminated against. Good, Kevin. I'm glad we could help. Now, could we look at some more pictures of your aunt's wedding? That party looked amazing. Okay. So the updated national sex ed standards from last year, the first uh, set came out in 2012, um, and now we have 2020s, stresses that sex education must be taught within the larger context of intersectionality. That is the fact that young people cross a variety of sexual orientation, gender identity, racial, ethnic, cultural, and other groups. To realize the full potential of comprehensive sex education, considerations of race, class, culture, ability, socioeconomic status, and other important characteristics need to be more deliberately woven into curricula, teaching, and evaluation. Now, I had mentioned about embodying and being about an intersectional life. So it's not just teaching what it is and making sure that you're including other aspects of identity, but it's also about being about it. The fact that we have an ASL interpreter, we have a live transcript with closed captioning right now, that is about being intersectional. What are equivalents that you're doing in your classroom spaces for your variety of different visual learners or auditory learners or kinesthetic learners? right? We already do that and we scaffold a lot of our lessons, but I want to make sure that you're thinking also about including it in ways that 
represent students that are in your classroom. So when we're thinking about the visual representations, are they all stock images of white kids? Or are we showing kids who are fat, who are BIPOC, who are in a wheelchair, right? We want to make sure that we are really representing what the actual world looks like. Now, embodying intersectionality in your life can also be healing, and I am proof of that. So I am a teacher, but I am not defined by that one identity. And if I was, I probably wouldn't be healed enough to be even keynoting today's conference because that means I wrapped up everything about me, my multifaceted self and said, nope, I'm just a teacher. And they've tried to cancel me, I guess. But I recognize that I have many other identities and it's leaning on those that really helped me to heal. Healing happens in community. So I had to recognize what communities am I a part of? I'm not just a teacher at a school. So I have other people around me besides the teachers that are in the faculty lounge. I'm a lot of other things. Here are some of them. I'm gonna stay on this slide for a sec because I want you to think about how each of these identities may have led to a source of healing. Me being a woman of color, a femme of color, specifically an Asian American femme of color, already made, allowed me to lean on others who were also Asian American femmes who are maybe dealing with something similar. Or in my femmes of color spaces, in sex ed, how could I have gotten help from them? So I inquired there. Being a child of a physician helped me to really lean on science in a way that I was raised on. And that helped me to remember that what I'm actually teaching is right, is okay, is supported. Being raised Catholic, being a daughter of immigrants helped me to look at other cultures and other religions that might be in opposition to what I'm dealing with to understand and empathize where their opposition is coming from, where their tension is coming from. Now, as a teacher, what can I do then to maybe make my language be one that is accessible to minds that are similar? Being a baker reminded me that I have ways to easily access therapy, not just being a therapy patient because I only see her once a week. So then I can be baking up a storm to help me relieve some of the stress and anxiety that I was enduring. Being a teacher of queer kids, this was one of my biggest affirmations in my healing process. I received notes of encouragement and love from these queer kids, alums now, who had said, Ms. Fonte, please don't stop doing what you're doing because I'm free now because of what you taught me when I was your student. So I knew what I was doing was right because what I was doing was life-saving and it allowed students to come into school and feel safe just being themselves. No guards up, no needing to code switch. They felt comfortable with who they are. I changed that culture at the Dalton School to one where we have out trans kids, we have out non-binary kids, we have out gay kids, we have out asexual kids, we have out bi uh, kids that are questioning and able to say, I just don't know yet, but I know I can explore and understand it more here at this school. And I feel really proud that that's the legacy that I left. So I knew that all of these different identities were ones that helped me to understand that I'm not just a teacher, but I'm a teacher that is a member of a variety of different communities. And that's where I was able to lean on figuring out ways to move me forward. This is how sex ed can move forward too. Letting your kids tell their story, you disclosing your own story, 
whether it be of privilege or of marginalization or pieces of both because you want to humanize yourself in front of your students and show them that you too are a multifaceted human being. And sexuality is one huge important aspect of your identity, but it lives and is couched amongst many other identities. This is an emotional coping toolkit right here, just knowing that you have so many other identities. When we're teaching this, we have to remember that health is a human right, but we're not all experiencing it equally. So when we talk about our identities, we have to bring it into the classroom. This is a hot take, I get it. But this wheel of power and privilege helps us to understand it. And when you fill in those spaces, there's a lot of people who are gonna hate it. They don't wanna believe that they have privilege because they've suffered before. We want people to be called into a space where they can recognize where they have privilege and where they also may be marginalized so that we can connect as a human race and uplift each other so that the systemic barriers are no longer a barrier. Why do we need to do that? Because when we understand systemic oppression, then we are already taking the first step to dismantling it. Critical race theory is just actual American history. So think of it through the lens of, we're not excluding white kids and white folks. We're not excluding the people who want to be called girl by saying menstruator. We are including everyone. It is more inclusive to actually be talking about what is the reality of human bodies. So we want to make sure that that language that we're using represents that diversity. When I teach body respect in my first grade classes and in my 12th grade classes, it's as simple as teaching them that they are deserving of kindness, meaning one, I can think about my body kindly. Two, I can feed my body with kind th things through all my senses. And three, I am treated by others kindly. Now this sounds simple, but all y'all here, 444 of you, how many of you can say yes to all three? I'd be surprised if I even heard one person. I still struggle with this. Why? Because we have writers out there who are defining for us what is a good body. And oftentimes those writers are not people that are thinking as inclusively or as intersectionally as us educators can. So if we can't say yes to all three, our kids certainly can't, but we can build a new house for them that can and will. Our goal is that they experience safety, fulfillment, and pleasure. This slide works across religions, cultures, countries, generations. We want them to be emotionally and physically safe. We want them to feel good in their body about their identities, surround themselves with people that make them feel fulfilled. And we want their bodies to feel good, have fun, experience enjoyment. Does mainstream porn get us there? Does white supremacy get us there? Does typical American history class get us there? There are too many things that are in the way. Do gender roles get us there? Does rape culture get us there? No, a lot of these things do not. That's why our work is life-saving because we are centering on a pleasure-based perspective so that they can increase levels of scrutiny of the people around them and be able to have a self-mastery of how their body works so that they won't even dare being around someone that doesn't know how to provide them with the fulfillment and pleasure and safety that they are deserving of. And if they're the student that's trying to figure out, am I offering that to the person I'm engaging with? 
then we already are giving them skills to be self-aware and emotionally intelligent so that if they're unsure, they pause and they negotiate, they communicate, they create a dialogue so that consent can be practiced and can be a lived experience and be the norm. But we don't live in that world that supports these things. That's why I'm a sex educator. We can do that. We do a lot more than a condom on a banana, despite what the rest of the world thinks we do. That is why I will always stand by this work. That's why I'm so proud to be a part of the sexuality education community. That's why I'm so proud to be able to tout programs like Amaze in every school and every community that I work with because they are doing this work and they're doing it intersectionally and they're not the only ones. There's a lot of us and it's these types of conferences and networks that can bring us all together so that we can forward this and not only heal from whatever we've been conditioned and socialized to believe from those systemic oppressions, but we can also remember the collective strength that we have. And that's the only reason I'm healed today. It's because of the collective. It's because of this community. Until the lion learns to write, the story will always glorify the hunter. Now, even if you've learned to write, there are those who will actively choose to silence you in favor of the hunter. And whatever you've read about me in the media or maybe media in the future to come, I want you to know that you now know my full story from literal day one to today. Do not let them glorify the hunters. Friends, all 440 of you, I want to thank you for giving me the privilege of belonging. That is truly a gift and one that I wish upon all of our young people that we teach every single day. Thank you so much.